Could be one month, could be two months. Three months. Could be. Four months. I can see that happening, yes. Eight months? That's a realistic timeline. Eleven months. Perhaps. <laughs>
that leads to your characteristics. And I used Homer Simpson, right? Because uh, Homer Simpson, him and his family have yellow skin. And so we would obviously think that the reason why they have yellow skin has something to do with their DNA. There must be some difference in their DNA. But the question is, what is it? Why is it that a change in their DNA results in them having yellow skin? What actually happens in between here and here to give them the yellow skin? So the chief question that emerged after Watson and Crick was how does the information in our DNA actually give you your traits? And so in order to understand this question, we have to dive back into proteins, right? The thing you need to understand is that the traits that you have, like hair color, eye color, skin color, your height, right? All the traits that you have ultimately come down to something going on in the proteins in your body. So proteins are the molecules that give you your traits, or another word might be phenotype. Now, we learned about proteins last semester, and so you might remember that proteins are long molecules, and they're made up of monomers. And those, and those monomers, um, I'll just put your attention over here, those monomers are called amino acids, right? Each of these beads on the string are called amino acids. And when you link amino acids together, they create a protein. Now, what's gonna happen though is that protein, based on the amino acids that are in here, is going to fold into a certain shape. And then that shape is going to impact what the protein does. So the things to remember from last semester is that the order of amino acids in this protein determines the protein shape. And the shape of the protein determines its function. I like to think of proteins like tools in a toolbox, right? The, the thing that gives a tool its function is its shape, right? Now, you could use a wrench as a hammer, but it wouldn't work as well. And it would be pretty difficult to use a hammer as a wrench or use a wrench as a screwdriver or a screwdriver as a tape measure or anything like that. All of these tools have their specific function because they have a specific shape. And the same thing is true of proteins, right? Your proteins, the shape of your proteins is what determines their function. Now, if you have some sort of condition or some sort of disease, this might come down to a misshapen protein. And actually almost all diseases, if they're genetic, come down to this, that a protein in your body has gotten misshapen in some way and no longer does the job that it used to do. So what we need to figure out here, if we're going to answer the questions from before, is how is it that DNA gets converted into protein? How do we take the information, right? Just remember, you know, DNA is just information. DNA by itself doesn't do anything. How is it that we go to protein? And so protein is going to be our traits. Um, it's also going to give us our phenotypes, right? These are all going to come from our proteins. So how do our cells do this? That's a big question. And that process by which they go from DNA to protein is what's known as gene expression. Okay, if someone said, hey, express yourself, you might paint a picture or write a song or do something like that. But expression is taking sort of the characteristics that are inside of you and displaying them for the world. So when we ask what, how are genes expressed, when we ask that question, what we're asking is how does our DNA turn into protein? Now, a perfect way to illustrate this is to come back to viruses. So last week we talked about how viruses replicate, and this is a perfect example of gene expression because um, what's interesting about viruses is that even though they're not alive, they still have a genotype and a phenotype, right? They have DNA, so that's what gives them their genotype, but they are also made of protein which is what gives them their phenotype. So even though they're not alive, we can use them to understand um, the process by which we take the information in DNA and turn it into protein. So remember, when you have a virus, the first thing it does is it enters the host cell and it inserts its own viral DNA into the host DNA. Now, once that DNA is inside of the nucleus of the cell, 
um, the cell's own machinery copies the viral DNA. So the virus tricks the cell into copying its DNA. And then the information in that DNA is converted into RNA. So DNA, the information in DNA, is copied into an RNA form. And that RNA form leaves the nucleus. And that RNA information can then be used as a blueprint to construct proteins. Now, proteins, remember, are what viruses are made out of. Viruses are just protein shells with DNA on the inside. So we can take that copied DNA and the, uh, the proteins that have been created to construct new viruses. And then here, the new viruses, after they're constructed, are going to break out of the cell and infect more cells in your body. Now notice something. When we talked about the, the recipe and the chef and the food, notice there was something that came in between the recipe and the food. And in that case, it was the chef, right? The chef was the person who actually took the information in the recipe and made it into the food. Now in the same way, there is something in between DNA and protein, and that intermediate, that thing that actually directs the building of proteins is RNA. So this here is the central dogma of biology, that we start with DNA, that DNA is copied into RNA, and then the RNA gives us instructions for how to build proteins. So like I said, this is the central dogma of biology. And so I want to break this down for you and offer kind of a um, kind of an outline of what we're going to be doing here in the future, right, for the future of this class. So first of all, when the virus replicated, we saw that we took the DNA of the virus and we used it to make more DNA, right? And this process is called replication. Okay, sorry, that's a little bit hard to read, but this process here, taking DNA, copying it to make more DNA, this is called replication, all right? But then we take that DNA and we convert it into RNA, right? Just a minute, I'm going to change the size of my marker here. So this process of going from DNA to RNA is known as transcription. Transcription. The word transcription um, is kind of a, a word that means to copy or to make a um, to make a new copy within a different form. So DNA, we're taking the same information, but we're turning it into an RNA form. This is called transcription, and then. Um, the next step, which goes from RNA to protein, that process is called translation. Because we're taking the information in RNA, which is its own kind of language, and we're converting it into protein, which is a different kind of molecular language that we're using here. So this process is called translation. So in future videos here, in future lessons, Mrs. Cook and I are going to break down the process of DNA replication, the process of transcription, and the process of translation. And like I said, this whole idea is really important because a lot of problems in biology, a lot of diseases, a lot of things like that can be explained in one of these three steps, right? If something goes wrong during replication, you're going to have a bad time. If something happens wrong during transcription, some bad things are going to happen to you. You might get a disease if there's a, um, if there's a mistake between RNA and protein, so translation. That can result in genetic diseases. So all sorts of problems in medicine and biology you, in order to understand them, you have to understand the central dogma of biology, which is that DNA, the information in DNA, is converted into RNA, and then that RNA is used to construct proteins.